It is important to understand that collapse in cluster B personality disorders causes dysregulation. Dysregulation is the emotional reaction to collapse. In this sense, people with borderline personality disorder experience mini collapses, like mini black holes, <laughs> mini collapses one after the other, whenever they are emotionally dysregulated. Emotional dysregulation in the case of borderline is a reaction to perceived or anticipated abandonment, rejection, humiliation, and so on and so forth. And the borderline's depth of emotions, her inability to self-regulate internally, causes her to go through repeated mini-collapses. The narcissist is far more resilient, his defenses are much stronger, and so narcissists experience collapse more rarely, mainly when they cannot obtain supply. We'll discuss it in a minute. But the affinity between collapse and dysregulation is very important. The, these states are overwhelming, or in the case of narcissists, on some occasions, they're mortifying. Now, there's a lot of utter nonsense on mortification by self-styled experts and coaches, and you name it. Ignore. What they describe is actually narcissistic injuries, not mortification. If you want reliable scientific information about mortification, keep to this channel. Search for the word mortification and you will be rewarded. <laughs> okay. So, collapse is dis dysregulatory and overwhelming. What is the locus of collapse? The locus of collapse is a fancy way of, so of saying what causes collapse, the etiology, the causation of collapse. So, in the case of the narcissist, the lack of attention. Um, when narcissistic supply is deficient, not forthcoming, not regular, or if there is good reason to assume that um, it's turned off. <laughs> There's not going to be uh, narcissistic supply anymore. The narcissist then reacts with a state of collapse. The sense of self-worth of the narcissist is highly sensitive to the flow of narcissistic supply and his inability to maintain it uh, in any stable manner, inability to stabilize the sense of self-worth, leads directly to collapse. In the case of the psychopath, a failure to accomplish goals or the clarity that goals are unattainable both induce in the psychopath a state of collapse. In the case of the borderline, a threat to external regulation via rejection and abandonment and so on and so forth, this would cause a state of collapse. A lack of object constancy or a lack of introject constancy may induce a state of collapse if the object or the introject are crucial to the um, sustenance and maintenance of internal equilibrium and homeostasis. So, uh, in the case of the narcissist, if the object is a source of narcissistic supply, a lack of object constancy, the possibility of losing the object would induce a state of collapse. In the case of the psychopath, if the object is closely affiliated with the goal, if the narcissist wants to have sex with someone, take money from someone, that someone is the critical object. And a case of object inconstancy, when the psychopath is afraid of losing the object, may induce a collapse. So the locus of collapse is varied across the cluster B spectrum. But all cluster B personalities, and quite a few others, for example, paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, uh, all of them experience collapse. Collapse, therefore, is on the one hand dysregulatory because it's, it's overwhelming, it's threatening, but on the other hand, it seems to be some kind of regulatory mechanism. The reaction or the compensation in the, in the state of collapse is either narcissistic psychopathic or avoidant schizoid. Whenever someone with a personality disorder goes through a state of collapse, they either withdraw, withdraw, avoid, uh, isolate themselves and kind of lick their wounds, 
process everything that has happened, try to come up with a new framework to make sense of everything and to move forward. That's one type of reaction. Or on the very, the very contrary, they become highly narcissistic and, and psychopathic, highly defiant. They externalize aggression, become grandiose, become entitled in your face, sometimes dangerously violent. Now, we could map reactions, compensatory reactions to collapse according to the locus of collapse. It doesn't matter so much what is the underlying personality disorder, interestingly. What matters much more is the locus of collapse. So, for example, if the collapse is the outcome of a lack of attention or lack of ability to secure attention in covert, in covert states like covert narcissism, in this case, the reaction would be, in all probability, avoidant schizoid. But if the collapse is the outcome of failure, failure to attain or to obtain goals, the compensation or the reaction to the collapse is likely to be psychopathic and narcissistic. So, the reason for the collapse, the etiology of the collapse, determines the type of reaction to the collapse. And because collapse is experienced universally in all cluster or most in all cluster B personality disorder disorders and in many other personality disorders, we it's, it stands to reason that collapse fulfills some kind of function in the dynamic of personality disorders. And those of you who want to learn more about it may wish to watch the lecture I gave in McGill McGill University. Just type McGill, M-C-G-I-L-L, -L, uh, into the search bar, and you will find the lecture where I explain the role of the collapse as a mediator, a mediator in type transition. I'm not going to it right now. All cluster B personality disorders, and many others, for example, schizoid, schizotypal, paranoid personality disorders, even obsessive-compulsive personality disorders, they all have a psychopathic protector self-state. This is most pronounced and most common in borderline and narcissism, uh, as well as in all types of covert personality disorders. There's a psychopathic protector self-state. The role of this self-state, as the name implies, is to protect, to isolate the person from the environment in a way which would restore a sense of safety, stability, predictability, and determinacy. In other words, the role of the psychopathic protector self-state is to emulate a secure base, provide the individual with a secure base. It's an internally generated secure base, and in many respects it's self-deceptive and delusional, but it still does the job. When this psychopathic protector self-state takes over, so there's a collapse, and then there's a reaction to the collapse. And the collapse could be as, as bad as mortification. And in any case, it's overwhelming and dysregulating. So there's a reaction to the collapse. And the reaction to the collapse is compensatory somehow. There's a change, there's a modification of behavior that renders the environment less triggering, less threatening, and then the protector, the psychopathic protector self-state comes forward. It's a secondary psychopath in the case of the borderline. Someone with a borderline personality disorder would become a secondary psychopath. It's a primary psychopath in the case of covert narcissism, for example. So, but it's a psychopath all the same. And the job of this psychopathic self-state is to broadcast, to signal to the environment, don't mess with me, I'm dangerous and also to restore a sense of safety. Don't worry, I'm here to protect you. It allows the individual to experiment with another type. So an overt narcissist, under the aegis and protection of the, of the psychopathic self-state, a grandiose overt narcissist may become a covert narcissist. A covert narcissist will become an overt narcissist. And so on and so forth. So there are there is type transition under the umbrella, 
and the protection of the psychopathic self-state. Experimentation is, is rendered and perceived as safe. Um, there's a lot, a lot of interplay between schizoid states, narcissistic states, covert states, overt state. There's a lot of experimentation going on. And this is known in clinical psychology as identity confusion. So we're beginning to see the sequence. Collapse, compensation to collapse or reaction to collapse, the emergence of a protective psychopathic self-state, experimentation with other types or different types of personality disorder, because the original type has failed. The original type has engendered a collapse, so it cannot be trusted anymore. And there's a wish to experiment with alternatives, but it is not safe to experiment with alternatives under normal circumstances. It is, however, perceived and rendered safe when there is a, a psychopath protecting you. So that's the role of the psychopath. This experimentation with a variety of types, of variants of personality disorder, is very reminiscent of what Eric Erikson called the moratorium. It's a form of identity transition or identity formation. In Eric Erikson's theory of psychosocial development, uh, the moratorium is a period of experimentation, especially in adolescence. There's, a, there's this implicit task of discovering who you are and of separating and individuating from the family of origin. It's also embedded in a social context. Young people try out alternative roles, alternative sexual orientations before committing permanently to a single identity. Some adolescents are unsuccessful. They negotiate, they, they negotiate the period of moratorium poorly. They can't make up their minds. The experimentation failed, has failed. And then they experience confusion over role identi roles and identity. Their identity is diffused or disturbed and they have a problem with roles as role theory teaches us. So what happens to the narcissist after the collapse is similar to this. It's a kind of experimentation with other options, other possibilities. I used to be an overt grandiose narcissist. It led me nowhere. It created a collapse. I've been mortified. It's horrible. I don't want to feel this way again. Let me try to be a covert narcissist and see how it works for me. So this is kind of taking into account the fact that the narcissist's mental age is much younger than his chronological age. He's six years old, maybe nine years old. The moratorium explanation makes a lot of sense. It's actually a very, very young adolescent trying on other identities and other alternatives. In all these processes, there are a few emotions and a few processes, you know, a few uh, dynamics which are invariant. They characterize all types of collapses for whatever reason in all personality disorders, overt and covert. Number one, anger. There's righteous indignation. There is a righteous externalization of aggression. Libby, the great scholar of narcissistic mortification, called it differentiated between internal and external solution. And the vast majority of collapse states as distinct from mortification. In mortification, the two solutions interplay. Sometimes there's an internal solution, sometimes external solution. But in, in collapse, in states of collapse, there's always an externally directed anger, rage, aggression. And it's righteous. It's perceived as moral, uh, as if the person the, with a personality disorder has experienced extreme injustice and is reacting to it with indignation, moral rage, moral injury, and so on and so forth. Number one. Number two, um, during the fluid period after the collapse and when the compensation is just forming, but the psychopathic protective state, 
protector of the state has not emerged yet. In this inter interregnum interim period, there is a lot of goal orientation. The goal orientation is a harbinger of a protector psychopathic self states, self state because the psychopath is goal oriented. So there's the emergence of goal orientation. Um, and the goal orientation is compulsive, is overwhelming. The goal is perceived as irresistible. And so there's a reduction in impulse control and an inability to delay gratification, an emphasis on instant gratification. It is at this, it is at this stage that collapsed personalities, people with personality disorders who are undergoing a collapse. It is at this stage that behavior becomes extremely antisocial and possibly even criminal. The anger coupled with goal orientation, coupled with lack of impulse control, coupled with the need for instant gratification, it creates impulsivity, recklessness, dangerous, criminalized, antisocial misconduct. This is very typical of collapse states. Um, collapse states involve a lot of rumination. There is a kind of fixation or obsession with with the collapse locus, with the, with the causation of the collapse, with the etiology, the reasons for the collapse. And there's this rumination and obsession and constant self-analysis and other analysis and, and it coalesces with the anger, it feeds the anger. Actually, there's good reason to claim that the rumination is the fuel of the anger. The reason for, it's kind of a rationalization of the anger. I've been wronged. I've been the victim of injustice. There's a lot of self-victimization in, in this process. And those of you who have had the misfortune of uh, spending time with narcissists, no, and, and borderlines uh, are intimately acquainted with this phase. And finally, there's a resolution. Under the, under the um, umbrella protection of the, of the protector psychopathic self-state, there's a resolution. The individual settles on one of the two families of solutions, the narcissistic psychopathic solution or the avoidance schizoid solution. In both cases, it's a form of self-checkmating because both cases involve self-defeat or self-destructiveness. If you're schizoid and avoidant, your life is constricted and narrowed, then of course, this is a form of self-defeat. If, on the other hand, you become narcissistic and psychopathic in your face, defiant, reckless, and so on, you may end up in prison. <laughs> That's a form of self-destructiveness. So, both solutions are kind of self-involved, self-negation, self-denial. It's like both solutions are going out with a bang. And the psychological mechanisms involved are decompensation. The compensation is a very common reaction in cluster B personality disorders. When these people are faced with stress, tension, anxiety, fear, or threat, it is a common myth and misconception propagated by ignorant self-styled experts that psychopaths are fearless and they experience no anxiety. It's complete nonsense. The opposite is true, by the way, according to recent studies. So. All cluster B personality disorders react very dysfunctionally and very badly to stress, tension, anxiety, fear, fear or threat. And in especially in borderline and narcissism, less so in histrionic and psycho and antisocial personality disorders. But in narcissism and borderline, there's a process called decompensation. Decompensation is a breakdown in an individual's defense mechanisms, resulting in progressive loss of normal functioning and a worsening of psychiatric symptoms. In other words, they flip, they go, they become more and more not wackos, <laughs> more and more crazy, okay? Out of control, they disintegrate. 
to resolve this, somehow recover from this. Um, there's a need to regain mastery, regain self-control, and if necessary, regain self-control by somehow controlling or domina dominating the environment. There's a dissonance. There's a dissonance at the core of, of this whole process of collapse. This collapse challenges head-on the grandiose, inflated, fantastic, godlike self-perception of narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines, and histrionics. So there's a huge dissonance involved, cognitive, emotional dissonance, and so on and so forth. And to resolve this dissonance, the individual cannot use defense mechanisms because of the decompensation. He cannot, in other words, reframe and falsify reality anymore. The input from reality is not filtered anymore and cannot be ignored or denied anymore. And the input from reality is quite clear. You're a failure. You're a failure. You've been defeated. It's shaming. It's a shaming input. And so to overcome this combination of dissonance and decompensation, compensation renders the individual helpless. All the instruments and tools which were used in the past as defense mechanisms to fend off reality, isolate the individual, somehow create a fantastic paracosm space, alternative virtual reality, alternate reality. These tools broke down and the dissonance is on full display and fully accessible, it creates huge amounts of rage, shame, envy, hatred, self-hatred, self-rejection, self-loathing, and so on, negative effects. So to resolve this situation, which is intolerable, but also life-threatening, there's a need to regain mastery, regain control of yourself and of the environment by pretending that you are the sole authority, the sole and only power, the exclusive master. And this, of course, is the source, uh, psycho psychological, psychodynamic source of defiance. Defiance in your face, uh, contumaciousness, rejection and hatred of authority, they're all intended to regain mastery. If I'm defiant, it means I'm not dependent on you. It means I don't care about you. It means I couldn't care less what you do or don't do. Your choices do not affect me. I'm invulnerable. I'm un untouchable. I'm impermeable. I am... I'm the one and only. So defiance, recklessness, contumaciousness, they are all forms of signaling to the environment and to oneself that you're in control again. Control has been reasserted. Rationalization is involved. The individual affected rationalizes the defiance uses externalized aggression, misconduct, actions, in a way that would sit well with some rational explanation of what had happened to him. So this is Libby's famous internal solution and external solution. I have been the victim of malevolent people, so now I'm taking my revenge, for example. That's a kind of rationalization of externalized aggression and the assumption or reassumption, reassertion of control and mastery by pretending to be the sole decision maker. I'm going to decide when these individuals are punished because I'm godlike. There's a suspension of reality here, suspension of causality, definitely. It's as if actions don't have consequences, as if the present has no future as if you will never have to pay the price for your choices and decisions, no matter how egregious they are. It's a form of magical thinking, but it does the trick. In the wake of collapse, it restores these pretensions, these actions, this aggression, this, they restore egocentrism. And they constitute the total reactivity, the total reactance, if you wish, the total reaction to the collapsed state is a form of self-supply, is a form of self-audiencing, 
It's as if the individual has given up on the environment, has given up on other people, has given up on reality in the world at large. As if, as if an individual says, the only, the only environment I can trust is me, my internal environment. The only person I can trust is me, 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 me. I'm my own best audience. I'm my own best admirer and fan. I'm my best, most reliable source of narcissistic supply. I will never abandon myself. I never reject or betray myself. There's no fear of betrayal, trauma or anything. So let me focus on myself. Even when the solution is narcissistic, psychopathic, the solution, the, the reaction to the collapse is narcissistic, psychopathic, it is still, it still involves denouncing the environment giving up on the environment, shunning it, attacking it, rejecting it. The schizoid avoidance solution or reaction to collapse is, of course, renouncing the environment. So the choice is between denouncing the environment and renouncing the environment. Narcissism, psychopathy or schizoid avoidance. Denouncing versus renouncing. In any case, the environment becomes irrelevant and the person the individual who's been affected by collapse becomes totally self-contained and self-sufficient via self-audiencing and self-supply, nurtures his wounds, waits until mechanisms involving cognitive distortion and so on, rebuild the grandiosity, restore the false self, and then the individual is ready and willing to take on the world and he does then there is a re-emergence from the cocoon and a second round of engaging with the world on his or her own terms of course until the next collapse inevitable guaranteed collapse again in very rare cases collapse comes through a process known as narcissistic mortification. All in all, the cluster B personality disorders are not actually stable conditions. They're very fluid, they're in flux. It has been a serious clinical mistake to attribute to cluster B personality disorders a psychodynamic rigidity. Rigidity has nothing to do with these disorders. On the very contrary, they're chimeric, they're kaleidoscopic, they're ever, shift, ever shifting, they're shape shifting. And the collapse is the mediator of all these transitions. Much more in my lecture um, to McGill University faculty. Thank you for listening.